All right, so uh, maybe, now you started this magazine, Pipette, which is just beautiful. Um, what was the inspiration? Was it originally because you went to the Loire and couldn't find outlets, and so you thought, oh, I'll just start my own publication? Or what was the driving force yes. behind this? Yeah. I, I originally was just going to try to publish, like a, a, a self-publish a book just about that trip to the Loire. And then I thought I could also commission other people to do stories and make it more of a group thing. And then there's more voices involved. So it began with um, two friends as a project called Tear, and it was broader than natural wine at that point. But um, we did two issues of Tear, and then I sort of went off on my own and started Pipette. And the yeah, there there was just no there was no publication devoted to natural wine. I think at the time Punch Drink was doing a little bit on natural wine. They still do, um, and Alice has her newsletter and her books. Yeah. And other than that, I just felt like there was this void. And I wanted it to be print because I didn't want something else to look yeah. at on a screen. Um, and I didn't want to hire someone to do a website. I, I, thought, thought, I thought a print magazine sounded much more fun and interesting. Yeah. And yeah, I wanted it to be beautiful. Often um, I would pour my heart into an article and then there would be a stock photo put alongside it. And mm -hmm. I'm like, there are way too many talented photographers out there that would love to go to these wineries. Like they would absolutely love to hop on a train and go visit someone in the, in the Loire Valley. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so over time I found those people. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is gorgeous, and I, I can understand the motivation behind print because you're not competing with text notifications and social media and everything else. The reading experience is completely mm -hmm. different. It's far more immersive and just the tactile beauty of it and the, the photos, and it's just gorgeous. So how does that sync up or jibe with you know your natural wine ethos, the eco-friendly? I mean, you cut you have to cut down some trees to make this, right? Um, well, it is recycled paper, and okay. <laughs> um, the packaging that it arrives in is also recyclable. Um, okay. But yes, it, it definitely it does. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it is a product. Um, but recycled paper, yeah. I mean, I, I sort of insisted on that. I think I think the publisher offered me that straight away. I think the printing industry is quite conscious of the need to to, to recycle paper. Um, so that sure. was never even a problem in the first place, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, and we do a little bit of merchandise. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the um, the magazine? I mean, it's ongoing, Wait. you know, I still get messages from people that just discovered the magazine and they're like, how can I get all the issues right yeah. now? And, um, I just love that. Like, I think when the magazine launched, there was a, a sort of, a, um, a crest in terms of the growth of natural wine. And I just saw all of these businesses pop up, um, mostly in North America uh, and Australia as well, devoted to natural wine, shops, restaurants, bars. And they often came to me and they said, we want to have it when we open. We want people on our shelves opening day. Um, so I think there's been a, a huge embracing of natural wine and um, fanning out from cities like New York where it was concentrated and, and just blossoming. And so the response has been great. Uh, I think a few months into the pandemic, I mentioned that I was going to possibly stop publishing the magazine. Um, and that's not just because demand was going down and shipping prices were doubling, <laughs> it was, Partly because I just felt with everything going on, um, the incredible suffering and also Black Lives Matter taking center stage, um, a movement that had obviously been going on for a while, but really taking center stage, I thought maybe it's not the time to talk about natural wine. And people wrote to me and they were like, please keep going. We really enjoy this magazine. And I sort of had to rationalize with myself like, 
it's okay to make something that people just enjoy. Mm -hmm. We need that also. We that do. everything doesn't, do. yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It, it, it's kind of, I, I've had to rationalize my own career. <laughs> um, and maybe you have too, Rachel, but you know, mm. we're, we're not doctors saving people in third world countries, but I think there's, um, there has to be a place for pleasure, or as you say, everyday decadence to celebrate life. We work so hard. I mean, what you're delivering through your magazine and the wines is just joy and, and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the reward for, for being here, for working hard, for, you know, <laughs> surviving another day. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for so, saying that. So that's a good thing. Absolutely. Um, so let's, let's segue into your book. Do you have a, a copy of it or an advanced copy of it? Yeah, now? I have an advanced copy. Okay. So the okay, hardcover cool. versions okay. will be ready soon. Awesome. Can you show it up to the camera so we can see? There you go. All right. You had me at Pet Nat. There you go. Mm -hmm. That's great. So how did you, um, so first of all, let's tell us what a Pet Nat is so that we're all yeah. on the same page. Um, it's sparkling wine made um, without any additives. So typically the, the champagne method for making sparkling wine involves a secondary fermentation. So picture a wine ferments and goes dry and then you add a little bit of sugar and yeast to it and put it in bottle and it ferments again. And that's how bubbles happen. So a lot of sparkling wine is made that way. With Pet Nat, um, and I've got one that I'll taste later. It's yes. um, it's my own. So with Pet Nat, it's Jenna? generally bottled with a tiny bit of residual sugar, and okay. then the carbon dioxide is just trapped in the bottle as the wine, wine goes dry in the bottle. So, so the okay. bubbles are caused by one single fermentation. So it's also not fine and filtered and it should be organic and there should be no sulfites added. So it's a natural wine that is made sparkling in a single fermentation. Um, and just as a side I note, hope. it can also be disgorged and I think that's much better. So um, okay. we disgorge our pet gnats. So that just okay. means that we pop, so we, we store them upside down, then we mm -hmm. pop off the cap and let all the tartrates and leaves, which are stored in the neck, come out. Okay. It gets topped mm -hmm. up with fresh wine and sealed with another crown cap and then stored for a little bit before release. Um, disgorging really helps avoid that like explosion, which some people have experienced opening a pet neck. So if it's disgorged, it shouldn't happen. Yeah. And you have yours there? Yeah. Yeah, let me see it on the on the camera. Let's show it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, May as well uh, dive into it as we so it and your memoir. I made Pet Nat for three years, and then I okay. I didn't make it this year. It is it's very time consuming. You have to like think about a lot of things during vintage because yeah. you have to bottle it during vintage. Um, okay. And then you have to disgorge in winter. And with the book coming out and with um, having a toddler, I honestly just needed to make things a little easier on myself. Because um, like we touch every bottle, it's all done by hand. Um, and disgorging is a huge process. So this is the 2020 Pet Nat. And it was, um, I had finished my rosé first. It was a blend of Chardonnay with some okay. semillon that was pressed over gamay skins. Okay, cool. So I have a basket press. So picture a round thing with wooden doors and then okay. wood on top and a lever that pushes the wood down. Um, I think you probably have some photos. So uh, basically there were gamay skins in the press from okay. pressing Gamay. And so I, I pressed Semillon over that. And that's where the color comes from. So it's like okay. light pink. Yeah. Hopefully it's cold enough that it won't fizz out. Let me see if I've got my pictures here window. Let's see. I'm just going to hmm. this up and see. There we go. Let's see. 
see that on the screen. Here we go, share. Okay, it should bring up a picture of you here. Yeah, that's right. Yes. There she is. Okay. <laughs> that's great. I love it. Okay, so, wow, this is really artisanal. This is by hand. You're having to do this. Yeah, so there's there's no electricity in my winery. Um, I mean, when I rack, I use I use a forklift, but okay, everything's manual. So buckets, that's wow. all. We don't use pumps yes. at all. Okay, more gentle handling yeah. of the uh, of the juice. That is great. Oh, so you age your wine in amphora, like the clay vessels here? Yeah, those are a couple yeah. amphora that were actually made um, here in South Australia by a fifth generation potter. Um, and we've also recently started using ceramic um, eggs. It just, they yeah, literally are shaped like an egg. Um, okay. They're still amphora, they just have a specific shape. And those are made in okay. Spain. Oh. Yeah, we, we love ceramic. Oh, there's your magazine. <laughs> So show us the uh, the bottle then. Have you opened that? Yeah. Uh, the pet so oh, um, there you go. Yeah, it's okay. it's busy. It is a bit yeah. has a bit of a stone fruit character. Okay. It's like it's very bright. Yeah. Obviously, it has high acidity. Um, yeah. Pick early for pet nah. nap. Generally, pick early for sparkling wine. Okay. Um, okay. and I can really taste the semillon. Semillon has this. Is it weird if I describe it as it tastes yellow? It just tastes like <laughs> yellow. Like it. it tastes like straw <laughs> and it, it tastes yeah. like, um, I don't no. know, buttered buttered toast, like but sourdough a little bit. It tastes yellow. Yeah, um, it tastes yellow, okay. Yeah, no, I, I think it's that. a good, I think pet nats are really good with food. Um, mm -hmm. You can, Why same things that, that champagne would be nice with. So oh. like mm -hmm. fried, Red food, fried chicken, yeah. fish and chips, that sort of thing. We eat a lot of mm. fish and chips in Australia. It's kind of a national food. <laughs> I can imagine it would cut through the, the uh, gorgeous it cuts through the and fat. fat. <laughs> yeah, oh, that would be great. Wow, I've got another one here that is a field blend mm -hmm. from uh, Trail Estate, and it has got oh. so much stuff in it. It's yeah. uh, no sulfur added. Uh, lots of yeah. particulate here. Yeah. Trail so, Estate um, is a pee pet stockist. That's so cool. Oh, that's great. You can see all this stuff. Yeah, they make some wonderful wines, and definitely it's a, a natural wine, I would think, from all the definitions you've given us. So I love field yeah. blends. Field blends are really special. Yeah. yeah, and that's when they're mixing all the different grapes, again, traditionally, because yeah, uh, winemakers didn't know what was out there. They were just throwing everything together, right? And it's a great way to make wine. It, it achieves like, like a very special kind of balance and beautiful color. Yes. Exactly. That's beautiful. Wow, it's delicious. It has a lot of stuffing in it. <laughs> Almost savory. Yeah. I just yeah. sometimes find it hard to describe it. It's mm -hmm. anyway, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so how, do you see any difference between natural wines and raw wines or are they kind of the same name, like a Two names for the same thing. Yeah, so the name question, that debate occasionally pops up and it is a good debate. People have problems with the idea of natural wine. People, People have problems, problems with all of the names. I mean, you sort of pick whichever one works for you. Um, mm -hmm. I, say, I say natural wine because it prompts people to ask the isn't all wine natural? natural and then you can say no it's not and okay. I think that is a good thing I think it's a good conversation starter I've also just never really found the only other f term that I like is living wines I think living wines is really precise like it goes back to what we were talking about earlier the wine actually being like alive or in French they would say vivant which is a lovely word. And so um, you can sort of say whatever you want. You can say raw wines. I know people say pure, naked. I would not 
go with clean lines. That is more of a marketing term um, created by, I think, Cameron Diaz. And other <laughs> folks. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That caused another so. uproar in the industry, which is that I think you pointed out something very smart. Um, whereas natural lines are more about the production, like how the farming is right. done, the clean lines are about lifestyle. Not just lifestyle, but consumption, occasion. Exactly. I'm I'm doing self care with my my vinyasa, my yoga, and my <laughs> my clean water. Yeah, which is misleading. I'm keeping the toxins out of my body. Right. Yeah, and the the irony, yeah. because I mean it's alcohol anyway. And yeah, look, you know, I don't think we should be making claims that alcohol is healthy, healthy. or one way or the other. But um, natural wine right. is quite light on the palate. And it's generally, unless it's from a very warm region, it's generally lower in alcohol. And um, I think that's nice. And yes. I think it's, yeah, I mean, the whole well, going back to the whole Hemingway thing and having a bit of wine at lunch. Um, there's a quote I share in my book. He talks about how it would be strange to have a nice meal without some wine or some cider. And, and that's really, the that's where I'm at. You know, like we, we eat, food that is grown with a lot of care some of it's grown on our farm or nearby and the wine matches that and it's all considered to us part of um a relaxing healthful lifestyle um i also skipped there's days when i don't have anything to drink um mm -hmm. i also skip coffee on some days like i, I think we all have our own threshold for finding balance but <laughs> sure Absolutely. No, that's great. So if you were um, describing your memoir to someone, how would you describe it in a nutshell? So it's, it's really about how natural wine, I think it's a little bit of a coming of age story. Um, okay. It's how I sort of found myself through natural wine. When, when I discovered natural wine, I was waitressing and working I think at least one other job and studying fiction writing and mm -hmm. I was definitely very excited about what I was doing but I was quite lost personally and that's definitely described in in detail in a few scenes in the book I think in um my in my in the romantic relationships that I was choosing to be in um and I think I found something to latch onto that I knew would lead me to a better place. And it was natural wine. And I could have told, I could have written a book that was a bit more journalistic or a bit more, yeah. And, and I didn't because I thought in the end that my personal story would get the points across that I wanted people to understand. It, it brings people to, um, the Loire Valley, where right. I work harvest with Domaine Moss, um, a really, really amazing family. And it brings people to the wine bars of Paris, um, which is a very central part of natural wine culture, the, the natural wine bars in Paris. And it brings people to Australia, where I make wine again. And um, there's a lot in between. There's the Republic of Georgia. There's Sardinia, where we have a really amazing encounter with a winemaker who has lost his entire vintage. Um, but it's all told through my personal experience. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's great because people, um, I think that's the power of a memoir. You can still learn a lot, but there's more of a narrative arc. It's it's almost like reading fiction. Like there's, there are characters, your character, Wild Man's a character. I, I think that really brings the story alive because we want to read about other people. So as opposed to just the sort of winemaking and sulfur additions or non, no sulfur additions. <laughs> uh, and I think you really did bring it alive through your story, through your, your own journey in the book. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what, so what that's the, the book. Most, yeah. 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 And what did you find most challenging about writing the book? Um, it's hard writing about people you love. And there's a lot of people I love in the book. There's my best friend who lives in Paris who I haven't seen in years because of the pandemic. Um, there's my husband, there's mm -hmm. my husband's daughter. Um, and all of that was a bit, 
a bit stressful at times or a bit complicated. Um, and obviously, you know, I checked in with them before anything kind of went in the direction of publication. So that was hard. And so when to stop, I wanted to actually keep going and talk about my second vintage and my editor, you know, editors, you have to love them. They're so great at what they do. She was like, nope, your book stops here. I'm like, okay. <laughs> That's the next um, Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, gosh. Who knows? <laughs> um, who knows what that will be? So I think also just with, with wine writing, writing that's of a personal nature, there's this like balance where, um, you know, you, you can easily get in the weeds in terms of wine technicalities. It's difficult sometimes to know who you're writing to because, because with Pipette, I'm writing often for people who have some awareness of natural wine. With the book, it might not be the case. And so it was just difficult sometimes to know when to explain or when to just kind of roll with it. Um, so hopefully I achieved that balance in some ways. I think you did. Um, was there anything that surprised you, uh, that you surprised you in writing the book or did the, did the writing of the book change you in any way? Um, I think I learned that I can complete a book, which I'm still, uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, I, I wanted to write, I wanted to write a book for years. There were drafts of this book going back to 2016. Like I came back from the Loire, the Loire Valley. Right. And um, yeah, I think ultimately a book comes out when you as an individual are ready. And that's not necessarily like where your career is. I think it's where you are as a person. So mm -hmm. I think I, I worked through a lot to get to the point where I was able to like share a book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And did you find much crossover between your writing and editing for Pipette and the book? Like, or was it just a very mm -hmm. different experience? <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question. I'm curious to not be the editor for once. <laughs> like I'm uh, always yeah. editing other people's work. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure I had my editor's cap on in some ways. So my editor, Lauren Marino at Hachette, she works mostly with women's memoirs. And when we first chatted, when she was interested in my proposal, she said, I love, I love working on books about women's lives. Women's lives are so complex and interesting. And I was like, this woman has to be my editor. Uh -huh. It was just, just like, like exactly, you know, you're writing a memoir and you're like, why am I doing this? Like, why am I sharing all my personal information? I'm opening myself up to critique and like, who's going to read this? And then she said that and, and I was like, you. And um, she was great. She actually had a really light touch. Yeah, it was great working with her. That's great. And so did you go to, uh, I, yeah, I assume you had an agent and then you approached multiple publishers for this? Yes. And um, I am so grateful that I found my agent. I mean, I don't think anyone else could be my agent. She is <laughs> an incredible agent who loves natural wine and was already okay. aware of my magazine. And she was like, I think I've had your wine before. I mean, like I make 2,300 bottles and she's had one of my wines. Like that's how into natural wine she is. Um, she's awesome. Laura Nolan just made, was kismet, like finding her and she was, she was my third agent. So wow. that is fantastic. <laughs> it, it took a while. Like, what was the, I'm just being curious now, um, mm. did, how, like, did you go out to a bunch of publishers all at once or did you sort of she, target? She went out to a few and then Hashtag, okay. um, it was a preempt, mm. which means they and just those, kind yeah. of say, we want it. Oh, that's Give great. That is ideal. Uh, they take yeah. it to the market. No one could even get yeah. on it because they want it so much. It was so that exciting. <laughs> Oh, that's great. And so what is your publication date? Um, October 19th. All right. That's when it'll be on sale. Um, so one thing that's uh, important are pre-orders. So um, is it up? Do you know if it's listed on Amazon now and the other places? It absolutely is. So okay. for North American readers, 
So people in the United States, I recommend going to bookshop.org and then just yes. type in my name, okay. Rachel Signer, S-I-G-N-E-R, or type okay. in the title, you had me at Petnat, and then you can pre-order there, and that will actually go via independent bookstores near you. Yeah. Right, um, which is important. That's the small. Oh yeah, I'm not going to talk about no. the big guy. The big guy <laughs> okay. has my book. <laughs> um, if you are, well, the thing is, if you are, if you are like in Europe or Asia or South America, probably, probably. the big guy is the actual best way to get my mm -hmm. book for now, unless right. your right. local bookseller has a better way of getting it. Um, right. In Australia, there's Booktopia and Excellent. Angus Robertson. They have it on pre-order. Um, okay. And in Canada, you might walk in into your local bookstore and just ask them to pre-order it for you or yes. use the big guy. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. We also have chapters Indigo in Canada, but uh, we're going to have all the okay. links to... Okay. Um, Great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the UK, uh, there's something called Hive. They have it okay. on pre-order. Yeah. Okay. And pre-orders yeah. for anybody who's outside of publishing, they're really important because it, the more <clears throat> pre-orders that you get before a publication date, uh, the, it's a signal to those bookstores and the big guy uh, to reorder, which can also send a signal to your publisher to reprint. Um, but also all the sales you get on that um, from those pre-orders all count for that first week of sales. And often that is your best shot as well to making it to any sort of bestseller list. So it's really important, folks, please um, pre-order her book. I mean, it's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> and is it also on audio version, Audible or wherever audio books are as well? Oh, we're working on that. Yeah. Okay. So that'll come maybe a bit later. That's right. Right. Okay, cool. Um, and so now, as you said, there's not a lot of travel going on. So how do you intend to promote it? Are you doing a lot of Zoom tastings, um, podcast interviews, um, I'm sure? Yeah, a couple podcasts. Um, I love podcasts, actually, so I'm really excited about that. And um, I will be probably, there's going to be an excerpt shared. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'll share everything on my personal Instagram and on Twitter. So I'm just yep. at Rach Sig, R A C H S I G. Um, and I have a newsletter as well that yeah. perhaps your listeners might enjoy. Um, and I can share the link to you to pass on. And so one, once a month, I recommend a couple natural wines that I've enjoyed. And I also recommend a book that I'm reading, which is usually like not at all related to wine. Um, I read a lot of literary fiction and a lot of memoir. And right. so I'll well, share those. Well, I need to get your recommendations. I, I'm get on my newsletter. It's free. Yeah, yeah, there's lots of photos. Sometimes I share recipes or I talk about random stories right. about being a, a mother yeah. in Australia, um, a million miles from my family and what that's like. Um, so wow. it's just like a, a monthly ish thing and I share everything there. Is there a URL for your newsletter? It's unfortunately a bit complicated, but I'll, I'll, oh, that's I'll definitely okay. send I'll it to you. I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, we'll put it in that the show notes. That would be great. Link. Yeah, 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 for sure. So that everybody can find you. Um, I can't believe how fast the time has gone, Rachel. Um, yeah. Is there anything we haven't covered that you wanted to mention? We um, some time, if you I'm like. sure there is, but you know, I did, <laughs> I did open this like um, rosé that I thought might be fun yes. to talk about. Yes. And least, um, I, I just love discovering new producers. So I, I do yeah. sort of know these cool guys. Cool. So they're called Conley Barrow. And yeah, the cuvee is called Pink Freud. Okay. Um, and they're in Campania. And I, as soon as we can travel, I'm like yes. going to Campania. Yeah. I actually have quite a while back some heritage from Campania, which is just the area to the south of Rome, quite a large okay. region with high elevation vineyards and um, just fascinating for wine, really, really fascinating region for wine. And this is a grape called Alianico. And how many days of maceration do you think it had, Natalie? Just guess. I have no idea. Uh, Lots? <laughs> I don't know. Trick question, because it's actually yeah. direct pests. Um, oh, so okay. Alianico is like, I think it's like one of those grapes, like Syrah, Rah. that's so dark, you can just direct press it, and it looks like this. 
Um, so direct oh. press, just to explain, Explained. means that it went, the grapes went directly into the press. That's all. Mm -hmm. And um, they didn't this stay. is a lovely they rosé. They didn't contact with the juice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did not. Yeah, no, it's so it's um, it's a natural wine, and so they've actually this is really amazing. So their label is so clear. I'm not sure how close you can see it, but they've actually written "contiene solfiti non aggiunti," and so they're achieving a level of specificity that's extremely helpful. Has sulfites not added. So in the United States, any wine that's imported, it's basically legally required to write as, sorry, contains sulfites, right. which is super confusing to consumers because they're like, wait, why does my natural wine say contains sulfites? And so winemakers have started adding contain sulfites, but we didn't add any. And I think that's really helpful. Um, and this is also a biodynamically farmed vineyard. It's quite small two hectares, which is like around five acres. And um, yeah, it's just it's just two people. And um, yeah, lovely little Rosato to look for, yeah. Canley Barrow. I love the stories that, you know, as you said, when you visit these places, you're visiting with a family. So I love that aspect. Yeah. And it's that holistic living again. It's just, uh, mm -hmm. it's a wonderful, wonderful exploration of uh, culture and family and everyday decadence as you say <laughs> well Rachel, yes. this has been wonderful let's just see your book one more time um yeah. so that people know you had me at pet nat which is terrific that's great i love that and uh, i i know um everyone will enjoy it because you know whether you're really knowledgeable about natural wines or you have no idea what they are this is um a story that will that will still i think you know, mm -hmm. shed light on them, surprise you. There's lots of insights, but it's also your personal journey that it, it yeah. makes the memoir so worth reading. I mean, it's just, it's about love and connection and all that good stuff that uh, wine so facilitate. Much. Absolutely, it's a real pleasure. Well, Rachel, and um, really, yeah, really so quickly, um, just for your listeners, when they um, are participating in the in the giveaway, um, yes, just yes, to yes. specify, so what the 2021 subscription includes is issues eight, nine, and ten. Issue ten okay. is coming out in October. We're just finishing okay. it up right now, and those okay. are that's actually the last issue of Pipet. So oh, I'm taking, yeah, uh, I'm giving myself a break after okay. producing 10 issues. Yeah. Um, and so it'll be a, a subscription, meaning like a package exactly. of the three issues we produced in 2021. And um, um, most of the we, most of the back issues are on the website. So anyone who's curious, people all, always ask like, oh, where do I find it? Um, mm -hmm. There are lots of stockists in Canada, yeah. in the States, and they're all listed on the ppetmagazine.com website. If you just look at stockists at top, okay. um, yeah. but our web shop is super easy to use and okay. we can just ship them easily. Um, but yeah, whoever is the lucky winner will get issues eight, nine, and 10. Wonderful, they're so beautiful. Oh, I just like touching them. I can't keep my hands off them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right, Rachel. Well, thank you so much. I um, I wish you all the best with this launch. I, I know it'll be a success because your story is just, it's from the heart. And I think people will really connect with that and with you. Um, so I'd love to stay in touch and uh, have you back on the uh, the podcast and here on the live stream again. And maybe we can touch base and see how it, how it went uh, maybe a year from now or something like that. <laughs> That's a great idea. I've loved yeah. talking with you. Thank you so much for having me. It was really fun. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Rachel. Bye for now. Okay. See you soon. Bye.